On behalf of my colleagues, welcome to today's GNCC Lunch and Learn. My name is Mishka Balsam and I will be your moderator. Our theme for the next hour is defining your employer brand for the purpose of attracting and retaining top talent, something that has become increasingly more difficult. As employers, it is critical that we gain an appreciation of the value of a well-defined employer brand as well as know about some practical tools to define and amplify our own brand. In this session, you will learn about the simple, small steps that will set you apart in the marketplace. Define who you are as an employer and your unique employer proposition and create an action plan for a work environment that engages your team and allows you to amplify your brand to stand out among the rest, something that is becoming more and more critically important. And for that, we are joined by the Certified Human Resource Leader and Proprietor of Essential HR, Laura Tolhock, who knows that when a business faces HR problems, there is no room for ambiguity, only positive results. For the last 15 years, she has blended sound HR practices with her pragmatic approach to improve business performance. Laura leads a team of HR professionals as they navigate complex HR situations with managers, help guide decisions, and instill confidence with actionable steps. Laura, thank you very much for being with us. And before I pass it over to Laura, we're going to start out by giving a loud shout out to YMCA Employment and Immigrant Services of Niagara, who has been a leading partner of our Lunch and Learn sessions. Whether you're looking for an entry-level work, uh, work or for a more senior role, finding a job isn't always easy. And that's why they offer employment programs that support employees through this process. And if you're an employer, they offer extensive employment service programs too. And it is my pleasure to be joined by Jillian Pagnato, who is a passionate uh, individual about the work that she does for the YMCA Employment and Immigrant Services of Niagara. And so are we. Jillian, over to you. Thank you, Mishka. And uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as you know, uh, my uh, Cheryl Kincaid has retired and she, uh, she in the past uh, was a big part of uh, the Lunch and Learns. And uh, my hope is to become more of a regular face here with you. So uh, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Jillian Pagnata, and I've been um, one of the managers at the YMCA Employment and Immigrant Services for about 15 years collectively. Um, as Mishka stated, we do serve the uh, community of Niagara, um, job seekers, employers, new Canadians. Um, we have over 19 programs and services uh, currently. Um, and uh, we are happy to help where we can uh, with any of the employers, uh, people here today. Um, if you feel that our services can be of assistance to you to, you know, attracting the right person, job matching, um, if you're interested in hiring a new Canadian, um, I actually just participated in the uh, the roundtable with um, Minister McNaughton this morning, and there was a big push towards uh, you know, um, um, connecting our Ukrainian population that's uh, with us in Canada now. And it was interesting because I didn't realize as the amount of uh, uh, so many Ukrainian um, population that actually is here in, in, um, in Ontario right now, said 35,000 uh, currently. Um, and so part of that, if you can imagine, uh, connecting um, highly skilled new Canadians or Canadians that are here with us uh, that are coming in as refugees to employers that are um, experiencing a bit of a, a skills drain. So anyway, that's uh, just a little bit from this morning, but happy, happy to be here. Thank you so much and um, reach out. I will put the, our contact information in the chat for anybody interested. Jillian, thank you so very much. And thank you so very much of also actually bringing up uh, the population actually of the Ukrainians or people with a Ukrainian background. Uh, it's really interesting to see. I think Canada, after the Ukraine itself, has the highest um, 
percentage of population that have roots and links uh, to that country. So I think it's uh, extremely important to us and it's extremely important to us to strengthen those uh, links that we have. And uh, thank you for all the employment and immigrant services that you offer uh, to Niagans and to employers and employees. So really appreciate having you with us. And we also appreciate all of the participants who have joined us today. If you wish to enable live transcript, just refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen for that option. We have enabled it. And please also know that this session is recorded and will be made available uh, afterwards to all participants as well as on our website. We, as with all of our lunch and learns, would like it to be a highly interactive one. So the first part of it is about a 30, 40 minute presentation. And then after that, it will be followed up by Q&A questions. If you wish uh, to have a question, or if you have a question uh, during the course of the presentation, if I could ask you to utilize the chat function at the bottom of your screen, that would be wonderful. And please know that we're very much committed to getting to all the questions. And on that note, uh, I'm going to pass it over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Mishka. I'm just going to share my screen and, and uh, get the presentation up here. I really appreciate uh, the invite today to speak. The Lunch and Learns, especially the partnership with YMCA, uh, has a little bit of history with our business. So I actually went to a Lunch and Learn sponsored by YMCA on sales, gosh, about five years ago. And it was the first contact that I made that turned into a sale for our essential HR business outside of friends and family was through one of the Lunch and Learns. So they are near and dear to my heart. And I'm, I'm so honored to be able to speak today. And I'm so excited to speak about this topic because uh, I like to say that we are HR rock stars at Essential HR, the team and I, but really at the end of the day, we, we are really HR geeks and this is the stuff that we love. So this is really something that we're passionate about and we love to share with other people. If you have a chance uh, and you want to, let me see if I can scroll this through. If you want to get a download for today so you can follow along and access some of the practical tools that we have available to you. Here we go. You can access it here at essentialhr.ca slash employer brand. And if you send a, your email there, it will send you a quick document called the five steps to identifying and amplifying your employer brand. We are going through a few of those today. I always like to make the webinars and masterclasses we do very practical. Strategy is great, but taking home some tangible aspects from this next hour, I think is also very important. So there's some worksheets in there that you can use and follow along with or use them at a later date, but feel free to grab it there. So essentially, who are we? We are a group of HR professionals and we support small businesses. Now we define small business as five to 50 people. That being said, we provide services for scaling solopreneurs who are taking the hiring leap up until uh, employers of 100 plus in different facets. Our signature service is HR Relief, which is a monthly partnership retainer. Our clients come from all different backgrounds. So we have clients in pharmaceutical, in service, in construction, in nonprofit. We don't niche down. We love to help anybody that we can. So our conversation today is going to start with talking about employer brand. We're going to talk about evaluating your current environment and looking forward to what you want your environment to look like about building your employer proposition. So what is your elevator pitch for your company as an employer? And then we're gonna jump into recruitment flow. And I was, uh, I was really interested in adding job postings because I think there's a lot going on right now in the state of, of HR and the state of the workforce that is important. So I wanted to jump into some job po uh, posting tips and tricks as well. So let's talk about the state of recruitment. Now, if you have tried to hire somebody in the last three to six months, you will know it's probably a very different feel than what happened three or six years ago when you were hiring people. The state of recruitment has changed, especially in the last six to 12 months. So I grabbed a few recent stats that came across my email, and I thought they would be interesting to share here because it plays right into why employer brand is so important. So Canada has more vacant positions 
this quarter than ever before. I'm sure that comes as no surprise if you have tried to recruit recently. So employers are actively seeking to fill uh, nearly 100 and nearly 1 million vacant positions. So this is the highest quarterly number on record across Canada, 42% higher than the same quarter last year. Now, in 2016, when there was 100 vacancies available across Canada, there was 113 new hires to fill those vacancies. Currently, we have 100 vacancies and 44 newly hired employees for those 100 vacancies. So you see where our problem is starting to happen. And it comes as no surprise to probably many people about the consumer price index. So year over year compared with Q2 2021, we are 7.5% higher. What does that mean? It means life is more expensive and there's more pressure on employers to compete on salary at a greater extent. So average hourly wages for all employees have, rate, have rose about 4.1%. That being said, the offered hourly wage, so the one that you're giving the new hire, the offered hourly wage has increased 5.3% year over year in Q2. Again, what does this mean? It means that as employers, we have to start getting really smart about how we attract and retain employees. So employer brand, what is it? I want you to think about, let's think about Apple as an organization, as a brand. Let's think about WestJet. Let's think about McDonald's. And those three companies, now when I think, when, when I tell you to think about Apple as a brand, you're gonna automatically have some adjectives, some characteristics come to, to mind about Apple's brand. You're automatically gonna have some characteristics or adjectives that come to mind about WestJet or McDonald's or, or place any uh, company in there because they've established their brand and your experience has also influenced how you perceive that brand. Now we're gonna flip that a little bit and we're gonna talk about employer brand. So as opposed to thinking about Apple as a brand, as a product that you purchase as a consumer, I want you to think about it as an employer. Do you have any adjectives or characteristics that come to mind when you think about Apple as an employer? Or when you think about McDonald's, as an employer, or when you think about WestJet as an employer, where do those ideas come from? They might come from marketing, they might come from personal experience or the experience of friends and family, but these all contribute to an employer brand. And this is what makes somebody like myself think, you know what, when my daughter gets to be the age of wanting to be a, you know, in the workforce, I know McDonald's has an amazing training program. It's been well established over the years. I know that WestJet, from what I've been told on commercials, they're owners too. These are all things that they've put time and consideration into. But you're saying, Laura, I'm, I'm me and seven people. Why is employer brand important to me? So we're still competing for the same top talent as the big guys down the street as the Apples, as the WestJets, as the McDonald's, who have you know, quite a large budget for marketing themselves, not only as to consumers, but to employees. But as small businesses, we have such a unique proposition to our future workforce that I wanna encourage you to take the time and take the opportunity to think about what is your employer brand and how do you establish that? And how do you amplify that? An employer brand is the things that you want your company to stand for, and it's the things that are already stood for in your company, and we're going to go into that a little bit. But I wanted to start off with a quick story about one of our clients, and she was competing. She's in the PR and marketing uh, arena, and she was competing for a new graduate fresh out of, fresh out of university, and she made an offer to this young lady and she was so excited and the young lady said to her I really appreciate it I have an interview on Monday and I just feel like I need to take that interview in order to make sure I've looked at all my options and and, and I'm making a good decision and she called me up and she said or I really really want this this young lady she's going to be awesome she's going to be the right fit for our organization she said what can I do in the meantime it was a Friday afternoon I said you know what just relax 
you have a great recruitment flow. You have a great organization. You've explained what you stand for as an organization and what the future of, of this role looks like for your organization. You have to trust the process. And so, of course, Monday afternoon rolls around and I get an email from her uh, celebrating the fact that this young lady went to this other interview on Monday and immediately got out of the interview and emailed uh, our client said, I'm in 100%. This has solidified that you are the right choice for me and I'm so excited to get started next week. And that's what a great employer brand will do. When you've established who you are as an employer and you're you're able to identify that and you're able to explain that to your team and to the future, the future members of your team. So defining your employer branding goals is step one. Again, this is going to be more about why this is important to you as a small business. So if you know what your branding goals are, is it to recruit, recruit top talent? Is it to attract more people into your, your recruitment flow? Is it, is it to establish more of an identity for the team members currently? Is it about establishing a path forward for where you want to take your company culture from A to B or C or D down the road? But what employer branding does for small businesses is it helps differentiate you from your competition. It helps attract talent away from big companies. And you're like, how do I attract talent away from big companies? And this is where I think we lose some of our, our unique momentum as small business owners. Not everybody wants to work for the big guy down the street. As small businesses, we provide such amazing organizational culture, such amazing integration into teams. And I think sometimes we lose sight of it because it just is. This is just how we are as an organization. Organization. This is just how we do business. This is just how we treat each other. And it becomes so ingrained, all these great aspects of our, our companies, it becomes so ingrained into what we do and how we do it. We don't even realize how unique that is. One of our clients is a, a, small a smaller pharmaceutical company. And, and I was recently doing an onboarding for uh, one of their new hires. And I gave her her key fob and she says, okay, so this is how I sign in. No, nope, this is how you open the front door. Oh, okay. So then there's a biometric to sign in. I said, no, nope. it, you, you, you just come in and sit down in front of your computer. And she's like, so how do they know when I'm here? I said, you know, in this environment, we just expect you to be here, work your seven and a half hours, go for lunch when you need to go for lunch, come back at the appropriate time and go home at the end of the day. And she was so not used to that environment where there was not this constant watch and constant sign in and constant monitoring. She was absolutely amazed by it. So making sure that we find these small aspects of who we are so that we can amplify them. So before I created this presentation, I went to my team and I said, okay, there's there's some things that we've learned in the last six months of this recruitment uh, environment, and I would love to share them. So I've created a, essentially HR's hot, five hot tips, and this is the first one. In the environment that we currently are in, we just saw the stats, we are selling the job to the candidate. The candidates are no longer the ones who are only required to sell themselves to us in the same extent. If we had gone back two or three years, you know, I, you always remember that question. So why should I hire you? Which is such a strange question because I don't even know how to answer it if I had to answer it sometimes. And there's not that same pressure of why should I hire you? Tell me why you're so great. Why, why should I pick you over the next individual? Now the candidates are turning to us as employers saying, why should I accept this job? Tell me why I should accept this job and not the one down the street. And I say this not to put added pressure, but just to exemplify why understanding your employer proposition, why understanding who you are and what you offer and taking the time to really investigate that and determine what that is, is so important. So we're going to go into step two, which is evaluate your current work environment. And we're going to look at this in two steps. So the first is employee engagement. And one way to evaluate your current environment is take a look at who you have working for you currently. Why do they love working for you? Have you asked them? 
Why are they engaged? What motivates them in their role? And I would encourage you as you build out your employer brand and you're trying to determine who you are currently and who you want to be, find out what is so important to people in their current roles. Uh, another way that I, I have done this in the past for uh, some of the employers we've worked with is during the exit interviews. Yeah, we want to know where the opportunities are and we want to know what we can do differently, but we also want to know what made you stay. What was the thing that you're going to miss most about, about this organization? And one of those, when you ask those questions, you find out what is important to the people in your organization. And you find out what motivates them. You find out what keeps them engaged. And that engagement is that extra discretionary effort, that extra going from 95 to 100%. So employee engagement and finding out why people are sticking around, why do people love to work with, with your organization or love to work with you? Because if you're a small business, the culture in your business is so fully set on how you manage, how you drive the positivity, how you drive the, the excitement and the energy in your business. So first step to evaluating your environment is evaluating what is currently going on and why people love working for you. The second step is going to be evaluating your work environment. And I'm going to go through these uh, quickly, but in, in, a, in a pretty succinctly as well, because I think sometimes we forget about the little things that we have in our work environments that make a big difference. So, you know, if you have a physical location, what is your physical workplace like? Is it easily accessible? You know, maybe in Niagara, that's not such a big deal, but if you're out further in, in some of the more GTA areas, accessibility, free parking, that's a really big deal. Is your physical workspace a place that people like going to? You know, sometimes we don't think about the tidiness or the cleanliness of our physical workspace or the organization of our, our physical workspace, but you can feel the difference when somebody, uh, when a business takes pride in their physical workspace and you walk in, you're like, I could walk into this place every morning and really enjoy my cup of coffee and get, and get some great work done. Or the feeling that you walk in, you're like, okay, well, this feels this feels like something I could work with, uh, or maybe maybe it doesn't feel like something you could work with. Maybe you've walked into, had the experience where you've walked into a physical workspace and you kind of were put off. You, you noticed the clutter, you noticed. So taking consideration of the physical work environment is something that you can build into your employer brand because of how you reflect your physical environment is part of your your brand and your culture, the work atmosphere, the communication. So how do your teams interact? I always talk about, you know, we talk about silos and we talk about collaboration and it's not an either or, it's not a, a one is bad, one is the other. Do you have a team that is really strong in their individual qualities and experiences? And so they go and they build some great programs and then they come together and they collaborate and then they go back and, and they finalize their work. Or do you have an environment of full collaboration? So everybody comes together, brainstorms. How does your team operate? How do you operate? How do you manage? These are all parts of the work atmosphere and communication. Does everybody roll in in the morning, talk about you know, the game that was on last night or an episode of, of you know, Game of Thrones, have their coffee, relax into their day? Or does your environment come in and people hit the ground running, people are excited. And at the end of the day, maybe there's a different feel. What is already going on in your work atmosphere and your communications? Now, you might be saying, Laura, like there are things going on, but I don't, I don't really wanna highlight those. This is the opportunity for you to evaluate that and figure out how you want to make it different. So what steps can you take to create that work atmosphere or that communications protocol that you actually want to see and make that a part of your employer brand as well? Financial benefits and compensation. Um, how you evaluate people, how you reward people, how you go through reviewing people is all part of your brand. Is there a consistent increase every year? Is it based off of performance? All of these play into the bottom line of who you want to be as an employer. Then we can talk about, you know, vacation and personal time off, pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory. But I want to talk about a little bit about training and skills development, because I think 
this is something as small businesses, we, uh, well, we don't really have a training budget. Well, we don't really send people to university for additional education, but I want to take that and kind of make it a little bit more um, down to earth. So as a small business owner, there is a mentorship capacity that owners and our managers have to have. And if your business has figured that out, that is an award-winning aspect to what you do. Are you the type of person that takes people under their wings and can bring somebody in from university and make them um, a fantastic contributing member who's vital to the team within two years? Because that's an accomplishment to your leadership skills. Or do you have a team that's able to do that, that mentors? Because this generation coming in, these ones that are graduating from university, they are craving that mentorship, that growth, those conversations where they feel a part of what's going on. And we talk about it as something that's new, but let's be honest, people of all ages appreciate that mentorship, appreciate the growth, appreciate that you have a plan for them. And if you're doing that without even realizing it, because it's just part of your innate management and leadership skills, consider that as part of your brand and your culture, because that's really important to how your team operates. Of course, community involvement. Uh, we, We have one client who just does an amazing job at giving back to the community in terms of sending their people out to do practical things, Habitat for Humanity, uh, as well as just the social events. So is your team a social team? Are you doing, did you do paint nights during Zoom, um, which one of our companies, uh, one of our clients did? Do Do you have baseball tournaments and family picnics? Is that part of your organization? And I'm not saying it has to be, But if it is, let's highlight that because that is actually very unique. And you might think, well, everybody does Taco Tuesdays once a month, and and it's not. These little aspects to things that make your company unique, you need to amplify them and you need to know what they are so that you can talk about them with other people. So we're going to take this work environment. We're going to talk about um, identifying your employer employee proposition. So once you've established and and considered a lot of these aspects to who you are as an organization, we want to figure out how to create the messaging around this. We want to create the what's in it for me for the candidate, uh, which also answers the question why you should choose us as an employer. And we don't want to do it in a way that necessarily feels uh, shifty. So we use this these work environment scans and these culture environment scans to help us solidify who we are as an employer. One of the things I always like to say about Essential HR is is I'm a very, um, I love the first 10% of every project. And I hire people who are great at the last 20% because that's just naturally where I tend to lose motivation. But I also love to give big picture ideas and have people who can fill in the blanks. And I know that about myself. I am not good at itemizing A, B, C, and D in order of a step-by-step approach. So when I hired our first few business associates, we made sure that we could find people who are also able to fill in the blanks and who thrived with filling in the blanks. And that's not to say somebody who likes a clear set of directions would is a bad person it would just be a bad fit for my management style and knowing who i am and knowing that we are a you know a business under five people we have to be very clear about the management style of our team members what they desire and and what we have to offer in terms of myself and, and our lead hr business partners so when you identify your employee proposition we're going to look at it Uh, in a very simplistic manner. And if you had downloaded uh, the employer brand download, you'll see this is in your download as well. So we're gonna make it very simple because at the end of the day, I would love for you to go home and be able, or go back to your, your desk at the end of this hour and be able to just jot a few things down because it's going to work to your benefit very, very quickly if you're able to establish this employer proposition. So in it, we're going to talk about the description of the company. This is your your elevator pitch. You probably have marketing who's already established this for you. It's a quick shot to say who you are and what you do. We're going to talk about the company culture. So these are those intangibles that we talked about, whether there's a highly collaborative or highly skilled workforce that is more siloed. We're going to talk about, you know, whether it's a, a communication that, you know, 
Maybe your team loves Slack and they love the quick back and forth, or maybe your team would prefer not to talk over digital Slack and wants face-to-face -face or picks up the phone. All of those pertain to the company culture and how and the communication, and you want to amplify that in your unique proposition for employees. And then we're gonna talk about what the description of what the company has to offer. And these are some of those tangibles, those easy, low-hanging fruit, grab and go things. And again, maybe it's certain things that you don't even establish as something that is, is unique to your environment. Uh, one of our clients, you know, they're the owners and them and their secretary and the executive assistant, sorry, bring in their dogs every day. They have two dogs in the office. There's about 10 people in the office and two dogs. That's something unique to their environment. And it brings a certain feel and it brings a certain um, just energy to the building that is unique to them. You might have a fridge stock full of drinks and snacks. You're not going to put in your employee proposition that, you know, we also stock full of you know, sodas and, and bubblies and, and water for your convenience. No, it's going to talk about how we appreciate sharing a moment over a cup of coffee or a pastry. It's going to talk about what that means. We don't just stock it for the sheer fact of letting people have a Pepsi in the afternoon. We do it because we appreciate the team and we appreciate the moment that when two people crack open a Pepsi in the afternoon and share a laugh and go back to work, we appreciate what that provides the atmosphere. So when we've established our employer proposition, which can, which you know, should include these three aspects. What are we going to do with that? Because you're saying, Laura, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of thinking you're expecting of me. Uh, and what's it all for? What do I do with it? So we're going to talk about amplifying your employer brand. So once you've established what your employer brand is, who you are now, where you're going with your company culture and your brand, and and who you're going to, who you stand, what you stand for. How are we going to amplify that? How are we going to let people know? So internally, this is going to be a part of job descriptions. It's going to be part of our performance management system. It's going to be part of the policies and protocols for the organization. It's going to affect all of these internal systems, compensation structures, internal communications. It's going to be used externally most often to the greatest benefit in job postings, uh, your careers page on your website, your social media. And I'm gonna jump into social media a little bit more because I think it's really important to talk about amplifying uh, who we are as employers on social media. But the social and philanthropic activities that we do, all of these things have an importance. So for example, if, if you send your people to uh, Habitat for Humanity Build Day, or some other community initiative, are they wearing branded, branded um, clothing? And you're like, that seems like a little bit of a cheap shot, Laura. Like, yeah, we're gonna send them all out to do some philanthropic stuff, but make sure that you're representing the company. And it's not so much from the, the sake of, hey, look at our t-shirt and our branded information, but it's more about the fact that people are gonna look at this organization and say, hey, I wanna be a part of that too, because look what they did with their people for one day. Look at what they've offered, you know, this organization or what they're doing here. So when we, oh, hot tip number two, good HR is good PR. So everything you do with your employer brand in, from an HR perspective also plays into the PR of your B2B or B2C when it comes to your uh, consumer brand as well. So when it comes to social media, I've seen this work really well for some people. And again, sometimes it's just innate and sometimes it's um, purposeful. They've intended to do it this way, but Let's take a look at social media. Where can you amplify your employer brand? So company events and hashtags. And if you have a team that loves getting together, loves being, lo loves doing things together, is there a hashtag that you can use uh, from a company, company sponsored hashtag? And I mean, there's all kinds of other HR aspects to this that we might want to consider too, but making sure that we're amplifying the company baseball game or the, the family picnic 
Are you putting LinkedIn posts out there about your organization? Meet the team posts, making your business more human by putting the faces out there as to who the team is that are making things happen in your organization. Are you taking a look at Glassdoor and seeing what are people saying about us? What is the thing that pops out? And you know, sometimes it's negative and sometimes it's fantastic and you can learn about what people are saying on Glassdoor. Are you using the Google My Business account to your advantage when it comes to employee branding or sorry, uh, employer branding and talking about your employees? And this is all those things that we do that can actually be twofold. They can have two different uh focuses and, and get this two different objectives. So both the employer branding and the good PR on the B2B and the, the company branding. So hot tip number three, communicate, communicate, communicate. Use these little moments, these team shots um, in your social media because we're gonna talk about job postings, but building your brand, if you have a social media presence is gonna be really good when you have an opening. So if people know who you are as a brand, what you sell, what you stand for, but they also know what you, who you are as an employer, again, you've got two birds, one stone. That's a really awful uh, saying, actually. <laughs> so moving on to what I think is the most important aspect when you're recruiting and amplifying your employer brand is the recruitment flow. And I'm going to jump into some real practical stuff here because uh, we have learned how to pivot our, how we do things in the last six months to speed up the process, to try to make sure that we capture good candidates the first time and keep them. So we're going to talk a little bit about the recruitment flow. Now we've all probably in our careers uh, been a part of recruitment where we've been looking for a role and seen it not work well, you know, been ghosted for three weeks, have no idea what's going on, uh, have been interviewed by people who aren't prepared to interview, haven't looked at, you know, our name, let alone the resume, all of those things that happen because as owners and managers, we're busy. But let's talk about how your recruitment flow affects your employer brand. So this is a basic of our recruitment flow. We change it up sometimes depending on the position, depending on the employer, um, but what has been working well for us. So build, making sure your job description accurately reflects both the tasks and the KPIs, so the key performance indicators, so that you can create that job description and create a job posting. And this is where you're going to put that employer value proposition. And you're going to scale down that job description to be just the key points because it is your dating profile. Your job posting is your dating profile. So you want to make yourself look good. Now you've all seen job postings that are pretty generic. General labor, here's your five points. But you've also, if you want to take a quick look, going to Indeed, going to ZipRecruiter, going to Monster, of some pretty great job postings where it makes you say, hey, I don't know the first thing about electrical engineering, but man, I want to work for this company. They probably don't want me as the electrical engineer, but those job postings that just pull you in and they really describe the environment of, of the organization. And again, <clears throat> I do not want you to shy away from it because your organization is three people or 30 people. You can have that same feel in your job postings as well. So from the job postings, we usually let the job posting stay up about three to five days before we start screening resumes. And the reason being is that people are on the market and they are going quickly. So we don't necessarily keep the job posting up for two weeks uh, as one would previously do in, in years gone by. Because in two weeks, you might have lost a great candidate while you just let resumes sit there without being reviewed. So we review resumes daily, uh, starting after two or three days. And then the next step that we typically take is a pre-screen. So whether this means an email verifying the basics that we need to know about the individual. So is if the job is in a physical location, are they comfortable working in a physical location or are they looking for remote only? If the salary has been posted, are, are they comfortable with the salary, both the low end and the high end? If the job requires shift work, are they comfortable working evenings and weekends? So you want to pre-screen the candidates so that you can immediately know which ones are the ones who are going to uh, really be a good use of your time to actually speak to. 
We've in the past done video calls for pre-screens as well. We have done video submissions, which depending on the, the job itself is actually a great screening tool. So we've done it for marketing and PR roles, a video submission, just a quick two minutes using Loom videos. And this gives a great quality to that basic first step of the recruitment process to know whether the candidate has the energy that the, our client is looking for. So from there, we can go into interview. We've also, you know, in these pre-screen candidates, the video submission practical assessment, we've shifted it around depending again on the engagement. So we go into an interview, asking the right questions, being prepared and making sure that that process is quick. So again, we're looking at between screening resumes and sending whether it's a pre-screen invite or email very, very quickly. And then when a candidate is good, we wanna get them into an interview as quick as possible. We also do practical assessments and that means testing the quality of the candidate's work against what they say they can do and what the expectations are. Employment verifications and reference checks. This may or may not be something you do. We don't do it for all candidates um, or we don't even suggest it for all candidates just depending on the nature of the work and the nature of the individual. And then the job offer. So the point with the recruitment flow is that at each step of the way, you have an opportunity to enforce your employer brand or to detract from it. If you're an organization that says we have a great communication culture and your recruitment flow leaves gaps of one to two weeks between communication with your potential employees, they're going to say, well, if they have a great communication culture, is this our baseline of great? Because, you know, I haven't heard from them in two weeks. I sent them an email. Nobody responded. These are the things you want to make sure that your recruitment flow lines up with who you say you are in your employer proposition and your value proposition. The other thing to know about this is the cadence has to be quick. Right now, you want this whole process to potentially take no more than a week and a half to two weeks. I know, tough, right? But this is the problem. People are being picked off through the, the recruitment flow process. So while you're deciding on, do I like this candidate enough or should I see two more? Somebody else has said, you know what? I like that candidate enough and has offered them a job. So you say, you know what? No, it's good. I don't want to do any more interviewing. I'm going to hire this person. They're already gone off the market. So making sure that cadence is quick and there is a constant focus on recruitment. If you are looking to bring somebody on, that focus has to be there every day. And as much as I like quality decisions and being able to review what we used to think about, you know, taking time to review a candidate's uh, resume and a candidate's interview for two weeks. That now has to be two days unless you want to potentially lose that candidate. So hot tip number four, your cadence has to be quick. And then going to hot tip number five. So this is something else that is new to what we have done as HR, <laughs> HR professionals for the past 15 years. More so in the last six months, I've seen this uh, unfortunately be the case. You have to pay to play. So you can do all this work establishing what your employer brand is, marketing it in your job postings, but unless your job postings are paid job postings on sites, there is a good chance that the algorithm will never show it to the people who need to see it. When I, going back a couple of years, you know, used to be able to post for free on Indeed and get 50 resumes overnight. Now a free posting will likely get you zero postings, maybe five in a week. The, the I don't wanna say the culture of job postings, but the whole flow of job postings has changed and you need to pay to play. So what we've learned in the last six months, and we'll talk about a few options for job postings. So there's the big guys. There's Indeed, LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, Monster, and those are your big job postings for active job seekers who are you know, looking every day for new roles, who are signed up for job alerts. Um, and you're probably looking, you know, <laughs> Indeed has this fun little game now that they play where it's guess the amount that you want to pay for your job posting. So about six or eight months ago, I was hiring for analytical chemists and it gave me the suggested budget of 
eight to $11 a day. Now my suggested budget on Indeed, which means in order to get the same visibility on the job boards as everybody else who's hiring a similar position is now 25 to $30 a day. Um, LinkedIn is also, you know, to potentially a, a pay to play with a sponsorship. ZipRecruiter has a one-time fee. Monster has a one-time fee. Um, but at the end of the day, you're looking at probably three to $500 of job posting budget that you need in order to get candidates through these big guy job boards. There's your industry specific job boards and we love industry specific job boards. Uh, they're often a, a middle of the road price point, but they are getting directly to the people that you are looking to hire. So accountants, PR, marketing, HR, um, engineering, real estate boards, all of those can have industry specific job boards. Then let's talk about company social media platforms, because this is a real interesting uh, recruitment venue and something I fully promote. So if you have an organization that has a social media following, if you have people who follow you because they align, they like your product or they align with who you are, this is such an amazing opportunity to find people. Now, it might not be the people who follow you. So if you are in an interior design firm and you have people who follow you, it might not be the, the people who follow you who see that job posting on, on your social media site, but they say, hey, you know what, Joe? your values would really align with this organization. And they forward that off because they already know what you stand for as an organization. They've bought into who you are as a company. They love your, your feel and your drive and everything that is the it factor of what your organization does. And so they can find the people who they think would be a good fit for you. So this is why I always say, use your social media platforms and use them uniquely. I saw one social media uh, com or company that I follow on social media out of Atlanta um, and they were hiring somebody for their office and the, the owner of the company came on and gave a 30 second spiel of why you wanted the job, why you wanted to work for them. And I thought how unique and how great, because I looked at it and thought maybe I can move to Atlanta. I, I would love to work there. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to use what is fantastic about you and your innate energy and your passion for your business, or even maybe it's not you. Maybe you're like, Laura, I'm a total introvert. I will never go on an Instagram reel to tell somebody to come work for me. But maybe you have somebody on your team who could do that, who would just light up at the fact of being able to do a reel and talk about the great work environment that you have and why people would want to work with that individual. Company website is a great place to explain your employer brand. So when somebody sees a job posting, they say, you know, this is great. I've never heard of this company before. The first thing they're going to do is go to your company website. And instead of the six sentences that you have as your employer value proposition on your job posting, you have the opportunity to try to win somebody over on a careers page on your website before they even step foot in your door. This is, you know, your website working for you behind the scenes. So make sure that you've got a careers page, even if you don't do a lot of hiring, because this helps people understand who you are. So this is one of the most complex labor markets in our history. Um, and I just, I want to encourage you to know that if you're having a tough time with recruitment, if you're having, uh, if you're like, Laura, they're just a bunch of window shoppers or tire kickers, or I had a competitor steal our candidate between the time they took my job offer and we're supposed to start, or the employee just ghosted me completely, never showed up on day one. There's always opportunities for communication, but this is starting to be a little bit more inherent of the recruitment industry as a whole. So the way to combat that, the way to make sure that you are the employer of choice is know who you are, amplify who you are, and then communicate with your, your team members, um, or sorry, with your potential team members. One last story before uh, I kind of open it up to Q and A's. Um, we've always thought, you know, if somebody could come on board, be a great employee and stay for five to seven years. That, that's a fantastic service. And sometimes I think that concept has changed uh, where as HR professionals, we look for job hopping. Have they, have they job hopped without an apparent reason? 
you know, four times in the last two years. Okay, we got to investigate that if it's just out of personal choice. There's a lot of factors to go into it, but you know, longevity in a role has always been important. But as we come into this new future generation of, of workers, I had an exit interview with one young lady and she was really sad to leave her current job, but she was going to work with a former supervisor who she loved, but she loved the environment she was in. And she's like, I really, I really just wanted to be here. My goal was to be here two years. And she was there almost one. And she's like, so I didn't even like make it to my goal. And I thought to myself, gosh, we hired you with like this hope that you'd be here five to seven. And you were hoping, you know, you know, the baseline for you was two years. And so I think knowing that going in and making sure you can ask the questions around what's important to you, what's important around the succession planning, what does growth look like for this individual and establish those parameters so that you can have open communication about it is a way that you're going to not only attract the right team members, but retain them. In case you missed it on that second slide, um, this is the download if you wanna use some worksheets that we've created for identifying and amplifying your employer brand. So there's the address one more time. Uh, and I will say thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you taking your lunch hour and speaking with uh, coming on board today and listening to us talk about things that we love uh, in the HR world. If you want to follow us, we like to think we're a little bit fun um, from an HR standpoint. Uh, type of people that, you know, let's talk about risk during the day and then go have a, a great cocktail after. So we like to keep it light on our, our Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn posts too. So if you want some HR fun, you can follow us there. Laura, thank you so very much for the information. It's been extremely informative. Uh, I have to say that uh, even after all the years of working in the private sector and in the nonprofit sector, there's always something helpful that actually comes forward. So I really appreciate it. We have a couple of minutes left and I was wondering if we can get to uh, a few questions uh, that either have been submitted here during uh, your presentation, but uh, some of them also which were provided to us ahead of time of individuals who weren't able uh, to be here. So one of the questions, and I'm trying to get to about three or four in just these next eight minutes, if at all possible. So one of the questions is, of this information that you have shared with us, what can be applied to volunteer recruitment and retention? And yeah. how do you apply to that? Great question. So I would say a lot of it, um, because the volunteer recruitment and retention is pretty much the same as employee retention. So if we're looking at employee recruitment, how do we, how do we find that brand? Why do people want to spend their time with us and what can we connect with? What is the value to them so that they can align with our values and we can align with their values? How do we attract them? It's the exact same thing at the end of the day from an employer brand perspective, you're just changing the focus to volunteers. So there's a little bit less different of a motivation. You know, money might not necessarily be the motivation. It might not be the office dog uh, or the office parakeet. It's going to, you're going to have to take a look at the marketing on that. And even that list of, you know, physical environment and, uh, you know, community initiatives, all of that still pertains. That makes sense, actually. Now, the same on the similar area of question was uh, related to freelancers. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of employers utilize contractors uh, to help them out or freelancers to help them out. Um, does the same thing apply here too? I would say your recruitment flow for a freelancer is going to be very similar to your recruitment flow for an employee. The difference is being at making sure a your freelancer is in fact a freelancer or subcontractor, and they can't come back to you saying, "Hey, I was actually an employee, and you owe the government all these back taxes, and you owe me vacation and holiday pay." But that's a whole other webinar. But if you actually have a subcontractor agreement with somebody, the way you hire your subcontractor should be very similar to how how you hire your team members because they need to align with your objectives as well. You need to make sure, especially if they're customer facing or if they're providing any sense of, you know, who you are or doing work on your behalf, you need to in interview them and you need to establish key performance indicators for them in the same way that you do your team members. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question that has come forward is that organizations experience uh, that some uh, employees uh, were let go of, they're separating as mm -hmm. from a team member, and then a new team member or the decision is being brought forward to bring a new person um, on board. And that sometimes can have or leave a little bit of a negative impact on the morale of the team. How do teams work with that? How to best approach it when there has been a staff turnover? Yeah. So this comes back to the good HR is good PR. Um, and, you know, the inevitable glass door. I, I you know, even as an HR consultant, I, I kind of, glass door kind of scares me. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's two things that have to be considered. And the first is when you go through a termination, which is, let's be honest, it's stressful for us as business owners to terminate somebody. And it's even more stressful, the, likely for the person who is being terminated. So I always like to say, if, if we're going to do it, let's think about if I were the person being terminated, how would I want to be treated? How would I want communication going out? How would I want the messaging? And if, if you take it from that perspective, despite whatever whether it was not the, the employee's fault, you know, due to financial or, or whether they were, you know, race Mario Kart racing with the forklift in the back. We always want to take the approach of making sure that people get hired with respect and leave with respect. And if we take it from that approach, and then we think about the communication. And again, as the employer, you can't give a lot of communication around departing employees. But I want to take it one step further and say that we don't do, there's not too many companies that over communicate. Most of us have an opportunity to communicate more or communicate more effectively. And if we think that we have communicated enough, then there's probably one more aspect of communication that we still need to do. Uh, so in this sense, you know, figuring out the messaging for the team, is it going to be stressful? Absolutely. And how can we mitigate that with proper communication? So who's going to take this person's role? Who's taking on these responsibilities? Welcoming the new person, letting them integrate in and really controlling the narrative in the termination process. That, that makes that makes complete sense. It is a sensitive issue at all times because it's understood and seen in different ways. But I also like your point of saying like when you think you've communicated enough, then think about one more step that you could take. Uh, Laura, there's another question, and I think this is a really important one. And I've heard this from a number of employers uh, and individuals that are hiring for positions. Uh, they're asking if you could weigh in on posting a salary in job postings. How critical is it? Uh, does it need to be included? Um, because a lot of organizations um, don't do it. A lot of postings does not include the salary or the salary range. Oh gosh, um, how much time we got? Three, two minutes. Two minutes. More <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> so as a recruiter, when we do, when we do um, interview screening for uh, clients, I love when we post a salary range because oftentimes that helps people self-select. Now, at the same time, I often advise that we don't post the full salary range unless you're actually willing to pay the top end. Because immediately, if you say we're hiring for a marketing coordinator and we're going to pay 50 to 65,000, everybody who's applying assumes they're going to get 65,000. So unless you're really, unless you're looking for a junior person, if you're looking for a junior person, let's make that range 50 to 58, because if you're not going to post, if you're not going to actually pay, don't put the top end of the range. And I don't know, you know, depending on your pay equity legislation, I think most private enterprise, we, we're not subject to it. Um, some federal might be, uh, but oftentimes it is a self-screening tool that is very effective. But if you don't have pay equity within your organization, then that can be a problem. So maybe everybody is already making 60 to 70,000 in your business and you wanna bring somebody in at 45 to 55, perfect. Post, your, post, post it to your heart's content because it's not gonna cause internal problems. But if you haven't figured out the pay scales and the wage bands within your organization, they're not defensible, then you can cause yourself a lot of problems by posting something. So it's, you know, I love, wage wages posted on on job postings 
but there has to be a system behind it to back it up. Yeah, that makes sense. Laura, thank you so very much for being with us over this lunch hour. And my thanks also go to the YMCA Employment and Immigrant Services of Niagara for powering these talks that we've just had. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website at gncc.ca and will be emailed to all webinar participants directly. Um, there's a number of resources that were mentioned, and if you're interested in those, uh, please let us know. We'll make sure to share them with you as well. So thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you for joining us, and please stay tuned uh, with all things that are happening at the GNCC. Thank you.